As we proceed in our space endeavors, it's important to keep our eyes open for gaps. Things that we've bypassed, technologies that could help us along, that we've bypassed in the momentum of building an Apollo program, building a space station, sending robots to Mars. Now, a lot of people are tuned to the notion of gaps because it's natural to be paranoid and say, what about the warp drive we were promised, these Dean drives and all these other fanciful things. Well, remember, I'm a science fiction author, so I sometimes include such notions in a novel here or there. But I'm also a physicist, and I can tell you that I'm not going to be talking about any of those things. I'm going to be talking about technologies that are proven to be accessible within our reach that could help leverage our presence in space, but have been ignored. Back in the 1980s, I was a member of the California Space Institute, California's sort of Jerry Brown mini-micro NASA under the great Jim Arnold. Uh, Jim was one of my doctoral advisors, and he was the guy who predicted that we'd find ice at the lunar poles, so he's no shabby thinker. And we, um, we kept after NASA to try to come up with methods of using the space shuttle's external tank. This is the great big part of the space shuttle when it launches that carries 1,500 cubic meters of liquid hydrogen, 500 cubic meters of liquid oxygen, and it's all funneled through the space shuttle's main engines. One of the parts of it that really, really worked well. And what happens is this great big tank is carried almost to orbit. In fact, it would take zero additional effort to take it to orbit. They have to actually dive bomb it to get rid of it in the Indian Ocean. Never once has there ever been any endeavor to look into the tether-mediated, um, controlled storage of these great big pressure vessels in space where they could be incredibly useful. Um, reasons have been given, but not openly debated. I have a short story called Tank Farm Dynamo that people can look up. It's an enjoyable story in its own right at davidbrin.com. Download it, read it. It shows the concept of holding on to the space shuttle external tanks and using electrodynamic tethers to stay in orbit. The tanks are going to go away. We're almost with, finished with our shuttle launches. Lost opportunity. But tethers are another matter. It turns out that, uh, some of you may recall that some years ago the space shuttle tried to deploy a tethered sub-satellite mission. It cost about a billion dollars. They tried twice, got all tangled up. The science was lost. My friend Joseph Carroll wound in his spare bedroom a 20-kilometer tether that then deployed as a parasitic cargo in the shroud of a already already released Air Force cargo. For the total cost of $25 million, uh, he and his partners at NASA and the Air Force deployed this tether and got about half the science that the tethered subsatellite from the space shuttle would have, would have, caught, would have uh, attained. And in two subsequent missions, verified the theory that a long conducting tether Dipole stabilized so that it orbits around the Earth like this. One end close to the Earth, one end farther from the Earth. Would leverage against the Earth's magnetic field. If you were to drive electrons off a cathode at one end, using, say, onboard solar or nuclear power, you could actually leverage against the Earth's magnetic field and rise without expending any rocket fuel, not even the atoms that are spent, expended from a um, ion drive. And of course, if you spat out your electrons the other end, you could actually draw power from your own orbit. And by pulsing back and forth, you can use this method to essentially navigate at will in anywhere between upper and lower Earth orbit through MEO, through the Van Allen radiation belts. Uh, it's a fabulous, fabulous technology, totally unused, unexplored after those initial missions. 
Now this would be a great complement to another technology, which is solar sails. Now we're all familiar with the basic notion of solar sails. Um, some people have the misapprehension that it uses the solar wind. Misnomer, bad terminology there. The solar wind is um, protons, electrons, uh, sometimes heavier atoms, uh, ions that are driven our way by the sun's incredible sonic waves from the photosphere and through the corona. Uh, the solar wind uh, can impinge upon the Earth's uh, upper atmosphere. It uh, is channeled by our magnetic field. This is how we get the aurora. It's uh, one of the reasons why the magnetic field is so important to us. Totally inconsequential for solar sails. Solar sails simply reflect light and take the impulse of the light and turn it into momentum. Just like sailing um, a sail in the ocean. It's a fabulous system. In a very, very incidental ways, this type of thing have, has been used by some NASA spacecraft for steering. But in the 50 years we've been going into space, there has not been a single NASA or by anybody else endeavor to actually test solar sails in orbit to see how well they respond, the, what kind of control systems would be necessary, several different perspective models and designs to see if they can scale up. Because if solar sails can scale up to many kilometers across to be able to carry cargoes of a ton or two tons or 20 tons or more, then you could trade time for efficiency and money and send bulk cargoes all the way to Mars, as long as you don't care how long it takes to get there, which is fine for water, wheat, uh, uh, TV dinners, wrenches, all the things that we could decide the Mars mission needs in advance before we even choose a, uh, a mission profile or a design. I talk about this in, a, in another rant. The point is solar sails can't really deploy very well in low Earth orbit, because in low Earth orbit, there are still residual bits of our atmosphere. This is what brought down Skylab. Uh, this is why this, the um, space station has to constantly fire little rockets to keep itself from falling into the Earth's atmosphere from this drag of these few little um, molecules that are in the upper, upper, upper atmosphere or the lower, lower ends of low Earth orbit. And that's a whole ball of wax. You should read my short story, Tank Farm Dynamo, to discuss that. The point is that you can't deploy the solar sails down there because they have maximum drag. You need to get up higher. Well, it turns out that tethers are at their best at maneuvering around where the Earth's magnetic magnetosphere, where, where it's oh, magnetosphere, where its magnetic field is mediated by the presence of charged particles, which is exactly the domain within which solar sails don't work. Picture a mission in which a package unfurls a, a, a disposable tether. The tether uses electrodynamics to rise up to the point where a solar sail can safely unfurl and then go on its way. These are complementary technologies. I, I may be you know, outside of the main NASA community here. But no one can deny that these are technologies that deserve some investigation. We're not talking kooky stuff. We're not talking sci-fi. We're not talking um, far-out what-ifs. Now, far-off what-ifs include space elevators. And I'm afraid this is not in our near future, folks. Even with carbon nanotubes you're really stretching the limit, so to speak, in order to be able to have a tether that goes not only to 22,000 miles of geosynchronous orbit, uh, or 40,000 kilometers, but it must go considerably farther to a counterweight, farther out, which keeps it taut. The tether would have to get wider and wider and wider, be almost impossibly heavy and large near the top. The place where a tether makes sense is Mars, because the loads are considerably less. 
and you can see this de de uh, depicted in Kim Stanley Robinson's wonderful novel, Red Mars. Uh, so, you know, if you want to learn more about these things, drop by my site, uh, see Charles Sheffield's The Web Between the Worlds, Arthur C. Clarke's uh, The Fountains of Paradise. There's plenty that you can learn from good science fiction. Follow up on this stuff, but keep our, our visions and our ambitions ambitious but plausible.